All right, fair warning, this is a bit long and uh, it's probably gonna be a bit abstract too for a lot of people. Crossroads Contingency, drafted August 16th, 2011. Disclaimer, I'm making this video primarily because I've reached a crossroads in my own life. I think it's only fair that I stayed up front. This video is really about me more than anything else. The most important thing to realize in respect to civilization is that there is no specific reason for things to be as they are. Whatever the status quo may be at any given moment, it cannot be blamed on any one thing. Things are as they are because of complex interdependencies that effectively prevent systemic change at certain scales. All too frequently, following the event of a global crisis, people will point fingers at specific factors with absolute conviction that if only one thing had been different, the crisis could have been averted. This simply isn't true. Inversely, everything can be blamed on collective determinism. The status quo is merely the direct result of all our individual actions combined actions which are themselves determined by the foundational forces of the universe, i.e. nature. This is where the facts end and the philosophy begins. All we have by way of clarification is a limited historical record cataloging countless examples of failure and success. It's also important to keep in mind that the definitions of failure and success are fairly subjective they can and do change over time. That being said, the line has to be drawn somewhere. In terms of geopolitics and socioeconomics, it's relatively safe to define failure as anything that lowers our quality of life over time, and success as anything that raises our quality of life over time. These are wonderfully flexible definitions, because quality of life is both general and concise, while the phrase over time does not specify a set scale. It just suggests either a downward or upward trend fading away into forever. Just to elaborate, imagine that you live in poverty, yet your quality of life is set to steadily improve over the course of a century. This may actually be less desirable than living a life of incessant decadence that is slowly slipping into poverty over that same time period. Despite lording over the entire planet, the fact remains we humans have relatively short lives. 100 years of peace and prosperity could be easily achieved if we were willing to sacrifice the Earth's entire ecosystem to that end. The alternative is living comparably poor lives that will <coughs> allow for the possibility of successive generations we will never live to see. Morality aside, neither bargain seems particularly intelligent. Today the predominant delusion is that we can somehow live both of these lives at the same time. This isn't, however, a choice we can make individually, but rather a collective effect that happens automatically as we live according to various genetic and cultural principles. You might note that, despite this apparent paradox, nature is working exactly as intended. Granted, we have no idea what that actually, what it actually intends, if anything. My main intent with this video is to outline various observations, including the contingencies I have established in response to the status quo, which by my definition of failure appears to be failing. To address any one of the key factors is to strike at the root of every conceivable institution comprising the fabric of civilization today. The very foundations of modern living must be put on trial. No cow is too sacred. No convention or ideology is immune to rigorous re-examination. First question. Is civilization viable? Two quick answers. 
Short term, yes. Long term, no. The facts are fairly straightforward. We are using up natural resources faster than they renew, and we are simultaneously destroying the natural systems that make many of those essential resources renewable. If there is one factor above all others that is responsible for this overtly suicidal behavior, it is our global economic system, which uses scarcity to determine value. At a fundamental level, this means that plentiful resources are considered worthless and are therefore exploited and consumed until they either become too scarce to afford or used up completely. This kind of system might actually be practical if we lived in a world where every natural resource existed in a vacuum. Unfortunately, most, if not all, natural resources are intricately connected and interdependent. Abusing or depleting one resource affects the entire resource web almost categorically in a negative and irreversible way. Although the most destructive aspect of this process is that due to the distributed global nature of the attack, there is no effective way to defend against it. <laughs> what a good cat. <clears throat> Furthermore, the vast majority of the damage is done entirely under the radar and may take decades or even centuries to uncover. That is assuming we would even be able to connect the dots. You might think that if the damage isn't immediately obvious, then it clearly isn't a problem. You'd be half right. This is analogous to breaking a table leg. The table still stays upright, but if you put something on the wrong side, the whole thing may just tip over. The problem is that no one knows how many legs the ecosystem has, and we've been pretty busy breaking every one we can get our hands on. Not to mention, the human race is piled on top of this table, about a metric ton more of us than it was ever designed to support. So yeah, that is civilization in its current form. But what about pre-industrial civilization? How does that stack up? Low-tech hunter-gatherer societies are effectively sustainable in both the short and long term. Just keep in mind that there are good yet brutal reasons for this to be true. Life expectancy is dramatically lower. Living conditions are austere. Climate virtually dictates community viability. Overall quality of life may actually be higher in many respects, but the philosophical cost is steep. In the end, our mode of civilization is determined by ideology, not by science. Factually, there is no doubt regarding viability, but at the same time, it is not really a consideration. Clearly, it was at one point... There were cultures in the past that, for whatever reason, chose to live in a sustainable way. In doing so, they sacrificed their own future to ensure that consecutive generations would be able to enjoy the same quality of life. Our path is a different one. Here, I find the national motto, Carpe Diem, particularly apt. We have sacrificed the future in order to seize the day for ourselves. The etymology is quite enlightening. The actual passage from which the phrase is taken, seize the day, putting as little trust as possible in the future. Figuratively, the future is uncertain, therefore drink your wine while there is wine left to drink. This way of living is diametrically opposed to traditional native philosophies such as take only what you need and waste nothing. Still, we must go far deeper if we are to truly understand ourselves. Being human is not merely about surviving. Curiosity, creativity, ingenuity, there are forces inside us that will simply never be suppressed. Inevitably, over time, these characteristics inspire us to do things that defy reality itself. I love when people say, it's just evolution as if that somehow explained everything. Yes, it is evolution, but what is evolution? 
a side effect of physical laws we have yet to fully understand, a process of natural selection, mutation, and genetic drift through which organisms change over time. Change, that is all. No beginning and no end. Is there some hidden meaning or purpose behind it all? Not that we know of. So really, what is the rationale behind living disciplined lives to ensure a future for consecutive generations? This is the crux, is it not? The core philosophical dichotomy at the heart of 21st century everything. Who are the bigger fools? Those crazy suicidal maniacs burning through the ecological lifeblood like there's no tomorrow? Or those clinically insane, conservation-obsessed flower children struggling to sustain an ecosystem that only their children's children will be able to appreciate? The bottom line is that neither of these factions are going anywhere anytime soon, and yet they'll all be dead in less than a hundred years. So, out of all the conceivable factors currently contributing to the failure of civilization, which is the most crucial, the most central, the most universal? Additionally, how long has this condition been in effect? How has it survived the test of time, and will it continue to persist even after a catastrophic collapse? I have chosen ego as my starting point. Ego is more than just consciousness or self-awareness. It is the timeless characteristic that inspires grand delusions at all levels of society. Ego could very well be the defining characteristic of failure because it is the most profound form of blindness imaginable. Not only does ego require the constant denial of reality, it also demands that we substitute our own version of the story, effectively living in a world of illusion designed specifically to tell us what we want to hear. Although the most destructive quality by far is that ego scales at all levels, from the social circles of children to the elite circles of power and government, there is no aspect of civilization that escapes the ever-present influence of ego. Ego, in turn, nurtures a culture that is entirely self-referential in nature, which leads to the second factor, the great disconnect or self-imposed isolation that is endemic of failure. In essence, there is no higher power above or beyond humanity. There is no authority figure we can relate to. I say relate because this is an important distinction, since there is, in fact, a higher power, albeit an uncommunicative and ruthless force of nature that could effortlessly erase our species from existence. The problem is we are unable to negotiate with or even comprehend the mentality of this higher power. This is the ultimate failing of ego, a fundamental unwillingness to acknowledge anything that threatens its sense of supremacy, effectively pretending that such a higher power doesn't exist, simply because it won't communicate in a way that validates the ego's perfect world of self-confirming illusions. The result is that the ego attempts to recreate its own delusions in the real world, essentially mirroring the model established in the mind. Isolation is the first logical step, often manifesting in the establishment of artificial environments, starting with simple structures, eventually progressing into complex synthetic systems designed specifically to replace natural ones. Keep in mind, this is all just the physical side of the equation. There is a spiritual side too, and it's far more insidious. From an evolutionary perspective, this is all just another experiment. If it fails, nothing of value is lost. Everything will start over. However, a part of the current experiment is the fact that not everyone is a willing participant. There is always a counterculture. Ego is, after all, only an aspect of consciousness. If you want to take the theatrical route, it's possible to suggest that we are in the middle of the greatest and longest world war of all time. The war between the two dominant faces of consciousness, ego on one side, awareness on the other. In the modern world, it seems as though ego is winning, although in this case winning is actually losing. Make no mistake, 
Historically speaking, ego has destroyed every major civilization to date, if not directly, then indirectly via, via assimilation. Many would argue that our current civilization is merely the latest victim, currently in the advanced stages of ego death. Those who would debate this statement are likely to cite the countless benefits of globalization, which are initially impossible to discount, but that is strictly a short-term prognosis. Globalization is itself the biggest lie ever sold. It's only by way of the growing geopolitical disconnect between network nations that wealth continues to finance poverty. If anything, globalization is an anti-global movement that seeks to permanently establish and maintain a graphic socio-economic disparity. Although none of that really matters because globalization is just a mind game played by the ego. Wealth and poverty are both artificial conditions created by the ego to establish winners and losers in a world where winning and losing mean nothing if everybody dies. But it's not enough for the ego just to survive. It has to dominate even if that means destroying everything around it in the process. Consider for a moment that it can't be stopped. The ego will continue relentlessly to impose its dystopian vision on reality. Even if civilization is brought to collapse, the ego will live on. Slithering out of the ashes, it will begin again, building a new world it can dominate. This is the tale of human progress so far. Luckily for us, we were born into a relatively benign period of the cycle, and thankfully, reality has allowed this madness to persist, if only because it was possible. Think about that for a moment. Puts things in perspective, right? There is no point trying to contradict history, but that doesn't mean the future is set in stone. I've heard it said that the only hope for humanity is a paradigm shift in consciousness. But I've never heard anyone say how we're supposed to make that happen. I think the great unspoken truth in that statement is that we're not going to. Not because we can't, but because consciousness was born out of chaos, and the only way to reforge it is to thrust it back into the fires of hell. Ego is driving us back into the fire. Whether we follow it there or not is up to us. Our track record is pretty bad, so I'd say prepare for the worst, which is one reason I'm making this video. There is no way to adequately prepare for what's probably coming, so I'm not going to bother trying. After all, survival is something we're hardwired for. My interest is in the mind. After the dust settles, after the decades of pent-up denial burst the dam of blissful ignorance and wash away all the glorious yet twisted delusions of the 21st century, what then, what contingencies could we possibly offer the refugees? For one, awareness is the key to everything, like recognizing that ego is something that should be left smoldering in the ashes. If it tries to slither out, spear it through the head. It will never truly die, but it may be subdued. Our true wealth is our ecology first, our community second, and culture third. Money won't fix anything unless it is backed by life itself, and cities will become barren wastelands unless we build them with that in mind. Isolation kills the soul and breaks the integral connections between us and our environment. Biodiversity is distributed intelligence. There is nothing smarter nor stronger on this earth. But it's not conscious, nor is it invincible. Politics won't solve our most pressing problems because it, it is incapable of comprehending them. The past will continue to repeat until it runs out of resources. Then consciousness will have no choice but to change. When all this comes to pass, we will begin a new way of life, hopefully one that is considerably less ignorant, mindless, and self-destructive. But no matter what, it won't last forever. It has no beginning and no end.